I'll be continuing from where we left in the part one of uh, MRI brain tumor imaging and update. In the first part, we talked about how DTI and MR spectroscopy are useful as add-ons to the structural imaging in brain tumor imaging. Today, we'll look at perfusion, ASL imaging, and also functional bold imaging. Let's start off with MR perfusion first. It is today considered as the biological marker of malignancy grading and prognosis in brain tumors. It measures the degree of tumor angiogenesis and capillary permeability in the given tumor. And that is considered as hallmark in differentiating benign tumors from malignant tumors. And in malignant tumors, what kind of grading that you are dealing with. Increased RCBV, typical cutoff is 1.75, is almost always associated with higher tumor grades. Anything lesser than that is considered closer to benign. How does MR perfusion work? We must understand the concept of perfusion and how it is different from simple enhancement that we see on non-perfusion imaging. So simple enhancement, which was traditionally used for over 30 years, to look at the pattern of enhancement in brain tumors indicates only disruption of blood-brain barrier in the given tumor and at the margins of the tumor. It does not necessarily correlate with tumor grade. MR perfusion principle is based on neoangiogenesis. It assesses the number and severity of leaky tortuous vessels in the given tumor. This is associated with increased blood flow in the given tumor and increased blood volume. It also depicts the tumor grading very precisely based on neoangiogenesis and presence of leaky neovascularity. How does MR perfusion perform? So what we do is we inject rapid intravenous gadolinium approximately 15 ml of it at a rate of 5 ml per second. And then you obtain a time series of GRE EPA based intubated images cover, covering entire brain and then looking at the area of interest. And this is our sequential set of GRE EPA based images, T2 star images come. This is the area of tumor. The resolution is not going to be great but this particular portion of brain will pick up contrast early and wash out early. So washing out is seen here. So you get a set of about 32 uh, sets of images, which are then post-processed to look at the perfusion of given SOL. What are the current applications of perfusion in brain tumor imaging? First and foremost, it differentiates tumor from non-tumorous conditions like tumor factor demyelination or benign lesions which simulate tumors. It differentiates types of tumors, for example, glioma versus lymphoma versus metastasis. In the glioma, it allows us to grade the tumor more accurately. Also, we know that most of tumors will have multiple grading within the tumor. So which one to pick up for biopsy? and which is likely to give a higher grade, can be assessed using MR perfusion. In post-operative or post-radiotherapy situation, it differentiates recurrence from post-treatment changes. Also, it assesses response to therapy very, very accurately. It differentiates true progression from pseudo-progression, and it differentiates true response from pseudo-response, and we'll see some examples. Optimum cutoff values for grading high-grade tumors and differentiating them from low-grade tumors is today based on RCBV and also upon choline creatine ratio and choline NA ratio. The typical cutoff of RCBV is 1.75 to differentiate high-grade from low-grade. That of choline creatine is 1.56 and that of choline NA is 1.60. Based on this, MR perfusion has much more sensitivity, that is about 95%, quite good specificity, that is of 57.5%, and a very, very low error rate compared to MR spectroscopy. And here are classic examples. 
If you look at this post contrast non fat set P1 weighted images, this SOL barely advances. But on MR perfusion, its RCBV was 2.1, and on biopsy, this turned out to be anaplastic astrocytoma. One more example on structural imaging, there is hardly any enhancement in this left thalamic tumor. On MR perfusion, it showed perfusivity of 4.1, and on biopsy, it turned out to be GDM. Here are two different patients showing ring enhancing lesions. The first patient shows ring enhancing lesion in the midbrain. The other one shows two ring enhancing lesions in left frontal lobe. On morphological imaging, it would be virtually impossible to decide what we are dealing with. If you look at MR perfusion, this midbrain lesion is hypoperfused, whereas these left frontal lobe lesions are markedly hyperperfused. The first one turned out to be tuberculoma. The second one turned out to be metastasis from serial lung. Here is another patient having right parietal lobe glioma. The structural enhancement pattern is quite heterogeneous. You don't know whether you're dealing with high grade or low grade tumor. On MR perfusion, the perfusion was low to the tune of about 1.2. Patient decided to go against the medical advice of biopsy, came back after 22 months. And if we look at the imaging now, the lesion has increased remarkably in size. Cystic necrosis has increased. Enhancement and heterogeneity has further increased. MR perfusion showed RCBV of 2.8. So we know we are dealing with a tumor which was low grade to begin with and has now turned high grade. There is another analysis that we, what we have to do when we analyze MR perfusion. And that is called as mean curve analysis. So it's basically drop in the signal on the two star set of images that we are looking at. So when we inject contrast, after about 18 seconds, when the contrast reaches brain, if you're dealing with high grade tumor, the RCBV in the tumor bed will show steep fall and quick washout. And then the severity of drop and washout is what we assess using mean curve analysis. Here is an example. We know that we're dealing with a high-grade glioma in the right frontal lobe extending into the basic ganglia here. If you look at the mean curve analysis, the drop is very steep. Recovery is also very fast, but it is to the tune of about 60% from the baseline. So when the baseline recovery is low and incomplete, we know that there is a lot of contrast leakage through the leaky neovascularity that these high-grade gliomas have. So this further confirms that we're dealing with the high-grade glioma. Compare that with this low-grade glioma in the right perisimulian region. The pickup of contrast is not so steep and washout is almost 80%, 80-85%. So low-grade gliomas will have more washout. High-grade gliomas will have less washout. Here is another example of this left middle cerebellar peduncular tumor. It's dark on T2. It is showing intense homogeneous enhancement. We know we are dealing with a lymphoma. If you look at perfusivity, this patient had RCBV of 4.2. If you look at mean curve analysis, the pickup of contrast is very steep and quick. Washout also is very steep and quick. And the recovery is almost to the tune of 120%. And this is considered to be very, very typical of lymphoma. So lymphoma shows approximately 120% baseline recovery, which is considered typical. So let's try to differentiate using mean curve analysis glioma from metastasis from lymphoma. RCBV is very, very high in glioma, but is almost equally high in metastasis as well as lymphoma. But mean, cover, uh, mean uh, baseline recovery is much below baseline in glioma. It is below baseline, but not as low as glioma in metastasis, and it overshoots baseline in lymphoma. This happens because of angiocentric growth pattern and widening of perivascular spaces that are associated with lymphoma. Differentiating radiation necrosis versus tumor recurrence is also very clearly defined and has specific protocols 
when you are talking about MR perfusion. Here are two borrowed examples of differentiating radiation necrosis from tumor recurrence using MR perfusion. Here is a dirty looking lesion in this left parietal lobe glioma patient post radiotherapy. But if you look at MR perfusion, the perfusion is less than 0.6. So this is such of radiation necrosis. Based on morphological imaging, it is very difficult to guess that. This is another patient having two innocuous looking lesions in left frontal and parietal lobes in the periventricular region. But if we look at MR perfusion, these are intensely red. So you know you are looking at metastasis along periventricular region in this patient with left parietal lobe glioma, which was treated surgically and after giving radiotherapy. So the tumor bed is quiet, but there is spread along periventricular white matter tracts. Here is our own example of bed necrosis in the left temporoparietal tumor. If you look at this lesion, looks quite similar to this lesion, but if you look at perfusion of this lesion, there is hardly any perfusivity. So we know we are dealing with radiation necrosis here. The radiation oncologist must have overshot his area of interest. In the tumor bed, however, there is intense uptake and early washout, which is indicative of tumor recurrence. So there's tumor recurrence in the tumor bed in the temporal lobe and radiation necrosis in the parietal lobe. So that is about usefulness of MR perfusion in brain tumors. Let's move on to ASL imaging or arterial spin labeling and how it is slowly but definitely replacing contrast enhanced perfusion. Technically, what we do is we do not inject any contrast. That's how it is called as galvanum free MR perfusion. It uses magnetically labeled arterial blood water protons to use as endogenous stressor. So what is done is you label the protons going through carotid and posterior circulation by applying a tag. Then you stop the tag and get images without tag, minus out the tagged images from non-tagged images, and you actually get a CBV. This is how normal ASL CBF map looks, and this is how ASL without contrast looks. So here is a patient with metastasis in left posterior parietal periventricular region. ASL showing 4.2 and DCS map showing 3.6 of RCBV. We know we're dealing with a high grade tumor. Let's move on to bold imaging or functional imaging as it is called and what is its role in brain tumor imaging. So patients undergoing surgery, the surgeon would like to know the location of tumor and how near or how away it is from eloquent cortex. And also the surgeon would like to know cerebral dominance, especially in left-handed patients. So there are several articles. This is the one which is followed most often. What it talks about is location of tumor with the elopan cortex and the outcome. So if the lesion, if the tumor is away from elopan cortex by more than two centimeters, chance of that patient getting post-recession deficit is virtually zero. If the lesion is located between one to two centimeters of elopan cortex, one third of these patients will show deficit. If the lesion is located less than one centimeter from elopan cortex, almost half the patients will have post-operative neurological deficit. Here are our own examples. This is a patient with left frontal lobe tumor. The foot motor function, the primary area, is located about three and a half, four centimeters away from the tumor. The hand area is again located about three, three and a half centimeters away from the tumor, and speech area is quite away. So chance of this patient getting post-surgical deficit is very, very low. 
So that is about usefulness of functional MRI or board imaging in tumor imaging. Let's now look at certain upcoming things like fusion imaging. So if you can add PET to MRI, it will give you not only the structural information provided by MRI and functional information provided by MRI, it will also add metabolic facet to it. So a neurosurgeon would get not only structural and functional MRI information, but the surgeon will also get metabolic PET information. So it will give excellent human anatomical information using MRI, superior soft, soft tissue characterization by MRI, better temporary resolution by MRI, and comparatively less radiation hazard. Here is a borrowed example of a 44-year-old male who was a known case of left temporal low-grade glioma, operated six years back and treated with radiotherapy, now has suspected recurrence. What we see on routine structural MRI is a heterogeneous DNA region in the left front the periventricular white matter, which is hyperperfused on, uh, on perfusion imaging, shows high value on ASL, on ASL imaging, and also hypermetabolic on PET imaging. On spectroscopy, it is showing elevated choline and presence of lipid lactate. So we know we are dealing with a high-grade recurrence. Also, on DTI imaging, there is destruction of the adjoining tracts. So all this information, if provided together, allows neurosurgeon to plan his therapy much more accurately. One more thing that we should be aware of is also sampling bias. So it's our job to tell neurosurgeon where to biopsy from if he's not going to resect the tumor. For example, again in this borrowed example of right frontal lobe tumor, chance of getting high grade changes in the given tumor are better in this intensely enhancing area compared to its corpus cavusal part, which will show low grade tumor. Let's now look at some newer trends and the whole focus is now moving from pure structural and functional imaging to molecular imaging because we now know that tumor prognosis depends not only on histology but also on its molecular microstructure. There are three such important mutations which we need to report. That is IDH, ISD1, 1P19Q correlation and MGMT methylation. And these will actually tell you, in addition to the morphological and functional imaging, the eventual outcome in the given patient. Let's understand some key concepts in this. So if the patient is ADH1 mutated, it has better prognosis, and these are typically seen in local gastrocytomas. If there is no mutation, it is called as a wild type of glamas, and they have worse prognosis, and these are mainly seen in primary GBMs. If patient has 1P19Q co-deletion, which is deleted, that has better prognosis compared to 1P19Q intact, those patients have worse prognosis. And deletion is present in majority of oligodendroglymas. If patient has decreased activity of MGMT methylation, they have better prognosis, compared to patients who have normal activity, which will have worse prognosis. And this key concept was put forth in this meta-analysis conducted by New England Journal of Medicine about three years back, which talked about how long is the survival in low-grade glamas versus high-grade glamas. So this talks about temporal survival. So if we look at this graph carefully, Low-grade glymas, by and large, have good 15-year survival. High-grade glymas, hardly anybody survives beyond two years. Now, if you look at these patients in this blue line, these started off as low-grade glymas, but they had wild type of IDH mutation. So instead of behaving like low-grade glymas, they have actually behaved like high-grade glymas. So this tells us importance of how uh, molecular imaging is going to play a part in outcomes of the tumor in future. And the importance 
was given by the new WHO 2016 classification of brain tumors. So this has, molecular imaging has significantly changed the classification of a number of tumor families and it gives a greater reliance on molecular markers. And this is how today we are supposed to define the tumors. So histological classification is given an importance, but equal importance is today given to molecular information. So classification of tumor is divided into four layers. The final integrated diagnosis, histological classification, WHO grade, and molecular information. These three were always available. This one has added a new facet, and this has also changed several tumor classifications from 2016. So an anaplastic oligodendron, when you are describing it, you have to call it as infiltrating glioma with oligodendroid features by microscopy, WHO grade 3 classification, and IDH1 mutation with whole arm loss of both 1P and 19Q legs. Based on this, several new entities like epithelioid glioblastoma, diffuse leptomeningeal glandular tumors have come forth as new entities. And this will probably the way we will have to deal with brain tumors in future. So to conclude with integration of conventional and advanced imaging techniques, we can now provide increasingly detailed information about underlying pathologies. These details will aid in improving our understanding of brain tumors and help in development of new treatment strategies and regimes in future. So as I said in the previous part of this talk, radiology has to be both image-centric and patient-centric. We must understand that we are an important part of the patient management. Interspecialty communication and coordination is very, very important and we should be the first part of it. We should aim to change from volume-based to value-based imaging, from interpretation focus to outcome-focused reporting, and the responsibility of training our future generation with not only the advances, but these values lies with us. Thank you again for your attention.